Hello, welcome back to the Midnight Quill podcast. In our second episode of series two, we're talking about self-editing. I'm one of your hosts, Tegan, also known as TC Emerus. I'm a writer, professional ghostwriter, and fiction editor. My debut short story collection, The Weight of Rain, was released last year. We're joined today by two professional fiction editors. Hello, I'm Brenna, and I'm a fiction editor and consultant for women and non-binary indie authors of fantasy, science fiction, and romance. I'm also a voracious reader, and my love for books means I have a great understanding of what makes a story successful. You can find me at www.brennadaviesediting.com. Hi, I'm Annalie. I have been editing professionally for about a year, but I have been working for the past six years, writing editorial assessments and doing editorial work. I've been a reader for several different production companies, uh, assessing novels that are sent to them. Today we have a real treat for you, as all three of us are professional fiction editors and writers. Our discussion today will give you tips on how to get your manuscript in shape before you send it to a professional editor, how to proofread your own work before publication, and how to accept feedback. So my first question to you both is, what do you think writers should be looking out for when they're editing their manuscript before they send it off to a professional editor? I think there are two parts to that. Like there are two real things to look at when you're editing. You can edit the larger story and then you can edit things at the sentence level. Mm. I would say when you're editing the larger story, you should look at your story like you're a reader. So ask yourself questions like, uh, does my story start with a hook? Does my story have a climax? Is there enough tension in the rising action? Is the conclusion satisfying? Um, And I think something that really helps with that is if you make a style sheet to keep track of things like the timeline and your character description, things like your, your major plot points and where different parts of the story are set. I think that really helps with editing the larger story. One thing that can help when you have your first draft to start thinking about why you wrote it, what it is you want to say with it, and kind of start maybe touching on if you, if you do make an, an kind of an overview Um, of it to kind of start thinking about what the themes might be and what it is that you want to actually what will hook the reader in what what was it that hooked you into the story and is that actually shining through in what you have produced and that can help you kind of focus the text as well yeah absolutely it's really difficult to read your own work as a reader though isn't it Um, and I think that there's a level of objectivity that you have to you have to be able to distance yourself the number one piece of advice i give authors for self-editing whether it's the larger story or on the sentence level is to put your manuscript down Mm. which i know is super hard like people (laughs) don't want to put their story down but in order to get that objectivity you have to step away so my advice is you know close that document or put it in a drawer and don't look at it for at least a month Because then when you come back, you'll be able to see it with a more objective view. And then you'll be able to spot things that you couldn't see before when you were so deep in the writing process. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And also a really good trick I find, it's always helped me, is to print it out. Mm, mm. Or put it in a different font. And that can help kind of switch the brain. But yeah, 100%, leave it alone for (laughs) as long as you can. Absolutely. Yeah, because there will be things that you notice. For example, one thing that I always notice, especially when I'm ghostwriting, because that tends to be on a very strict deadline, whereas my own work, I I give myself a little bit more room to play. But um, I tend to notice that I will favor particular word choices at a particular point in time. So um, whatever week it may be, it's not conscious, obviously. Um, I might be using then a lot or after or um there's there's some verbs that i just hate now because (laughs) i use them all the time you know once you have some distance and maybe a bit of rest and recharge and some reading and some thinking in that time in between you're gonna come back to it with (laughs) some different word choices and some different perspective yeah uh which errors do we think are hardest to spot in our own work i think that usually at least from my experience um, from reading, I think that character motivation and keeping that kind of, uh, keeping that tight and keeping it quite clear to the reader is one of the the things that I feel like I spot the most where the stakes aren't there and the stakes aren't raised because the internal obstacles are not 
like present or are not clear enough yeah I think um it's difficult to remember about your own writing that there's a lot in your head that isn't on the page and um and that's that's great like you should create an entire world essentially and uh be able to think deeply about your characters and you know what what's motivating them but sometimes it's difficult to look at the mechanics of what's happening behind your plot as if you were a reader because it's all happening in your head at the same time as you're writing it so like I wrote a, a story for NaNoWriMo in 2020 and I thought it was great and had you know everything it needed in it and then I sent it to my best friend and she read over and said I don't understand what these characters want and I realized you know I know because yeah. it's in my head I know these characters really well I know what's going on yeah. but the readers don't know and I didn't give them enough for them to figure it out so really yeah I think that um with writing my short story collection, actually, <laughs> Annalie, obviously you edited it, so <laughs> you'll know. Um, I, I like to be really sparse with the details. I like to sort of have a bit of mystery, but obviously from writing it, I couldn't tell like which details were enough and, and you know, wh what was too much. And so um, it was only through beta readers and obviously having a professional editor that you sort of find that balance because I knew what the plot was <laughs> so I didn't really need to tease myself or create a mystery for myself so you will get blinded to your own work even if you leave it for a month like that's that's just how it is that's so true though because the other the other side that I see all the time is people putting in too much information yeah right like info dumping and yes. I always like to tell my authors, you know, readers are smart. So think of every story like a mystery and the reader is working with the characters to piece the clues together to get the bigger picture, but they don't need the narrator to tell them everything because they're smart. Yeah. Underestimating your reader is the worst thing you can do, I think, to be perfectly honest, because I think that readers are extremely sophisticated and I think it's, it's, it behooves you to, to, appreciate that and to trust that they will get it yeah the, we've actually talked about this a little bit in uh series one of the podcast so i can plug a previous episode here um <laughs> in our first episode show don't tell we talked about um avoiding exposition and, and one of the tips that um, my co-host maddie gave was um to put that information into a separate document basically <laughs> because especially when you're writing a fantasy world it's it's great for you to know the history of you know the intricate political workings of the town that you've created and your fantasy races or whatever um you don't always need to just splat a great big paragraph of info dump in there to explain it all because it's not relevant to your plot and your reader probably isn't going to be engaged, especially in the first book in like a, a long series. Yes, I like the phrase less is more mm. when it comes to telling people things. And it just makes it more engaging and immersive for your reader if they have to really work to figure it out. You just yeah. want to give them just enough. Developing our own stories is, is really difficult. Are there any writing or self-editing exercises that we can recommend to our listeners to help them develop their stories before they go to a professional editor? My biggest piece of advice here, I, I always tell people anything, anytime they ask me, what's your number one piece of advice about, you know, self-editing or editing in general, it's to read more. And I think this is a really good exercise for developing your own story. If you read books in your genre and you see what you like about them, what you dislike about them and what makes them work. And then you look at your own story and kind of, I mean, you don't want to compare them too much because obviously you want it to be different, but if you can hit those beats that make the stories really successful, if you can see what makes those characters really engaging, what makes the setting immersive and then apply that to your own story in your own way, yeah. that can help give you ideas or help you decide what you want to take from those stories to make your own story more successful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and equally in series one, uh, we did an episode about writer's block. Um, and I sort of talked about how you can find inspiration from lots of different things, reading definitely, but movies, TV, um, and this sort of, taking inspiration for real life as well my co-host Maisie was saying that so much so much of her 
um, inspiration is drawn from real life conversations and how that sort of helps her develop um, her writing theory, but also like her ideas. Um, I think you have, to, it's, it's about time, isn't it? We keep saying like, put it aside and, and, and come back to it with time. It's, and it's what you do in that time to develop your own mind that will help you develop the story, I suppose. Exercise wise, I, I do think that it's, it's very good to kind of try and find ways to make yourself aware of why you're writing this story fairly early on. Because I do think that if you have that kind of internal compass for um, this is the reason why this story is kind of speaking to me and why I'm engaging with this story, then if you do hit any kind of blockage or anything, you can kind of find your way back to that truth. And, and hopefully that can help unblock you because I find that usually when I'm writing and um, the text isn't flowing, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And usually it's an unconscious one. <laughs> and so instead of like beating your head against that page and thinking, why is this not working? Like taking a step back and maybe even, you know, deleting that chapter you're working on and putting it in a different file and maybe rethinking because there is something that is just not working. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's that's just kind of a mindset, I guess, not really an exercise, but to to remember to do that and to remember that everyone hits those bumps and it's it's to trust that it's actually a sign that maybe um there is something that needs rethinking absolutely yeah i think i think um as well as being objective we sometimes have to be like ruthless with our own stories and you know not be scared to use that red pen <laughs> metaphorically <laughs> or literally um so I think you you have to kind of almost perform a bit of a a bit of surgery, and and go back and and really s slice it apart <laughs> sometimes. Um, and another thing that we said in that episode, writer's block, was um, you know if you're struggling to develop um, a story or if you have writer's block with it, and you can have writer's block while editing something that's already written as well. Like <laughs> you can have a block about how to how to edit it to make it better um we said there were a few tips we gave but one of them was to change up the format and and so for example you might take a chapter that you've already written and turn it into a, a standalone short story um and that short story may never see the light of day but what you do in that process of condensing your ideas and condensing your plot will probably help you when you come back to actually edit the chapter and think oh i didn't need these details or you know yeah so you got to be objective you got to be ruthless you got to slice it apart and you got to do the hard work of thinking about it you I think we're all a bit scared of the work it takes to edit something aren't we like our own work it's really it's hard it's going to be hard and you have to you have to do it I mean, it's always that that dreaded imposter syndrome thing where you write something and then you haven't looked at it for two weeks and you start getting scared because you're like, maybe this actually just sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's horrible. Why doesn't that go away? <laughs> but I think the thing is that um, it just shows that you that you care and that you're going to develop the story because if you have such an ego about your own writing that you come back to it after a month and don't have any of that doubt at all then you're not going to make it any better than it currently is do you see what I mean because if you already think oh I'm the best writer in the world then you're not going to be spurred on to try and improve it to try and redraft it to try and make it the best thing that it can possibly be. Annalie I love what you said too about having that intention there and the focus uh, a friend of mine who's also an author, uh, her name is Jacqueline. Um, she has this meditation exercise she does before she writes where she meditates for three to five minutes before every writing session, specifically about what emotions she wants to evoke in that portion of writing. And I think that's really smart, right? Getting that focus set out first, because then you kind of have an end goal, what you want to get from it really helps drive you forward. So 
I want to move on to talk about beta readers because um, in our first episode of this series, self-publishing, we talked a little bit about um, how to engage with beta readers. And I really want to take this from an editing perspective. So um, do we have any tips for making the most of feedback received from beta readers, whether they be family, friends, colleagues, or, you know, other writers or professional beta readers engaged to help us um, to use it before we send our work to a professional editor? Um, their feedback might help you uh, kind of focus the intention, understand how your story is read by others. But also, if you don't know what your what your story is, nobody else can kind of help you, I think, find your way into it making proper use of I think feedback means knowing what you want your story to be and then looking at how people are interpreting your words mm -hmm. and whether that interpretation is landing near or far away from what the intention from what you want them to take away from it. Accepting feedback as well means how you deal with feedback. So um, I see a lot of people get really offended about what their beta readers and editors, as we're going to come on to talk about in a minute, um, but getting really offended about like what their beta readers have to say about their story. And I suppose it's something I said again about objectivity, like you, you have to be able to sit back and say, right, why did a beta reader not like it? Or what did the beta reader not like? And how does that relate to, like you say, your vision of the story and what you want it to be <laughs> and then you've got to reconcile those two things and put them together yeah my advice is always to sit with the feedback and really think about it mm. like don't make a snap judgment it you might make a snap judgment but don't let that be the only thing you take out of it right like you want to think with your brain and not with your emotions mm. Mm. because your emotions might be really hurt because the story is near and dear to you which is fine but if you think about it logically your readers, especially if they're not family, like if they don't know you, they're going to probably be giving you really honest criticism. So you need to think about where they're coming from and why they're interpreting the story that way. Absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. this is something that we'll come back to later in series two when we talk about uh, getting reviews, which is obviously after you've published the book. But if you can't handle what the beta readers have got to say now, they're probably going to be nicer than some of the readers you have later on. So, <laughs> Because absolute impossibility that everyone is going to love everything. And I think um, the whole point of feedback, be it harsh or not, um, be it constructive, is to help you grow as a writer. So look at it from that point of view. Like, this will help me grow. This will make me a better writer. And this will definitely make my story better and um, stronger and even more resilient when I send it actually out to be reviewed, like you say, yeah. and hopefully maybe even secure that the reviews are, are, are um, more five star than two star. Yeah, exactly. And I think that who you select to be beta readers is like really important for how you're going to take their criticism. For example, I was saying in the first episode of this series, self-publishing, you you need to select people who they they can be friends and family if you want them to but only if the friends and family are going to give you decent feedback so for example um my mother is a reader um and she's also very good at being objective but she's not very good at giving lengthy analysis so you know if it's rubbish she'll tell me it's rubbish but she won't tell me much more than that you know so you need to you need to pick beta readers who are both going to be um, objective enough to tell you if they think something's wrong, but also give you like in depth comments that will help you to move the story along. Because um, you know somebody saying this is terrible or this is good is is no use to you if you want to actually make changes. I think it's also helpful to have beta readers who are in your target audience yeah because these are the people that you're aiming to reach right so you need their feedback specifically if you're writing a romance novel and you give it to someone who only reads thrillers well <laughs> their feedback is going to be a lot different <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh my god can you there were very few murders <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the other thing I was going to say about beta readers is that there seems to be a myth that like a, a beta reader is just a free editor, <laughs> which <laughs> like <laughs> so upsets me as as like <laughs> as a professional editor because, um, and the the thing is that you may find some wonderful beta readers who will like do the legwork of you know checking for typos and stuff. I mean, amazing, great. Um, but I think that really downplays what you think an editor is actually going to do for you because a professional editor is going to do a lot more than a beta reader. And it doesn't mean that a beta reader is less important than a professional editor. You, you kind of, you need both really because <laughs> they do different things is, is what I'm trying to say. So, um, and I think that being able to accept the feedback of a beta reader is really going to help you to accept the feedback of an editor and and like use it appropriately because neither are your are your enemies, you know. Neither a beta reader or an editor is trying to be mean to you or like hating on your book. I see a lot of people see that, and that brings me on to the next thing I want to talk about. Actually, the some myths about editing and editors. Um, editors are judgmental, editors are writers who failed, um, editors are grammar obsessed and hate reading, you know, that kind of thing. There's this culture of like, my editor was really mean about my book and I don't want to give them my money because they're horrible. Um, and I just, I just thought we should discuss that and kind of get some of these myths out of the way. I love <laughs> these. I think they're hilarious. Like they just, I snorted when I first read over those myths. <laughs> Um, so like editors are judgmental is so not true because we make errors in our own work all the time. It's not like we're perfect and can magically write a perfect piece of writing. Like we know how much work goes into it. And, you know, even editors need editors. I make errors all the time in my blog posts. I have to get people to read over them. Yeah. And, you know, we know how hard it is to write effectively. We study language and we do professional development all the time but we still make mistakes. So exactly. definitely not judgmental. The editors or writers who failed is also hilarious. <laughs> it's like that, the, the saying that those who can't do teach. Teach, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, such an have, insult to like. Yeah, you have people. to know how to do something in order to teach it. I think writers really need to look at editors as like this pool of knowledge that because you can write a book without having technical knowledge or grammatical knowledge um so you should really look at your editor as someone to con consult about that sort of stuff um and just give you a, a second opinion as well um but <laughs> this idea that we're judgmental really it makes me laugh as well because can you imagine like the emotional energy you would have to have to like go out and <laughs> firstly become an editor then find all the clients and then just be like this is shit to like everything you read because that's so petty like no not at all we we love reading we love books that's why that's why we're editors we want to see writers succeed and grow their books and develop and yeah no we're not <laughs> we're not judgmental about your texts there is this the word trust comes to mind. Yes. If you're going to hire an editor, I feel like you need to be kind of in that headspace where you're ready for someone to come in. Because for me, it's kind of, it's a collaboration. It's, it's never judgmental. And it's, it, it's a partnership much more than I'm, you know, I would never come in and tell anyone what to do. Yeah. I am there to make suggestions to hopefully deepen and, and help evolve the text but it's still the writer's text like I yeah any suggestions made would never ever be judgmental in any way saying this is wrong <laughs> you can't do this you have to do it this way like no I will look at what the intention I think the writer had when writing it and then discuss it with the writer zero judgment involved I mean, there are technical grammar rules, you know, or spelling and punctuation rules, but a lot of times those rules are just guidelines and part of what makes fiction effective is breaking them. Mm -hmm. So, yes. you know, we're not going to judge a sentence fragment because maybe the sentence fragment actually works better. The one myth that editors are grammar obsessed, like, yeah, we might know a lot about grammar, <laughs> but I have more important things to do with my time than obsess over people's grammar. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I know. And I also think like for me, I think syntax is so much more important than kind of like the 
grammar of the, I mean, just as long as the paragraph or the sentence actually gets across what, yeah. again, exactly. back to the intention, but you know, if anything is muddled and doesn't make sense, that's a problem. Like that's something that needs to be addressed. But I also think that, you know, I am definitely not um, a punctuation police type of person. Of course, yeah. I'll change something if it doesn't work <laughs> exactly. because the impression of the syntax becomes like muddled and wrong. But, but yeah, I find that, I find that really funny. <laughs> It is, yeah, it's really funny because I think most editors would agree that cohesion is so much more important than like the nitty gritty grammar rules because you can write something perfectly well without knowing like the intricacies of how to use an auxiliary verb or something like in the correct grammatical way. And and people get really hung up about that because you don't have to know those things to be a writer. And it's not necessarily true that your editor is going to come along and sort of pull apart what you were intending to say for the sake of grammar. It just needs to be cohesive and telling a story. You know, as an editor, you feel like actually, oh, this is the true expression of this text. Then you know, of course, keep it in. I mean, I personally, as a writer, write very short. I love staccato kind of short sentences like that, just like very quick impressions. Um, and you can't do that for a whole book because that's exhausting for the brain. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can do that and you can kind of break those rules because yeah. it is how you express that, that scene. Yes. Um, if an editor had come along and said to Irvine Welsh that like, you can't write in dialectal language then that would be really unfair because you would be restricting his voice as a storyteller um so yeah your edit your editor is not going to come along and and mess with your voice and you have to have a trusting relationship with someone so i think like the process of selecting an editor is important because you need to find someone who you think is not gonna <laughs> sort of be judgmental about it and and um professionals aren't basically. Yeah, that's a really good point. I always uh, tell people who are looking for an editor, you know, you should try and talk to a few because yeah. really not every editor is right for every project. No. Like there are different editors who will click better with different people or who just are better suited for a different project. And that could be because of experience or because of the genre they work in, but it could also be because of their enthusiasm for the project or you know, their particular editing style. So it's definitely good to, I don't like to say shop around <laughs> commodities, but it's good to talk to a few yeah. editors. <laughs> exactly. And and I think that um, most editors are aware of that. And sort of if we get an email or a message, we know that you're sort of trying to get a feel for who we are as a, as a person and as an editor and how we're going to engage with you and interact with you um because it's it's you're like passing over your baby to an editor basically aren't you <laughs> well i mean i think that's also one of the one of the the responsibility i feel as an editor with having someone put their faith in me and my ability to help them i that's i mean it's an amazing feeling when i get to help when um, we're having conversations and, um, the story is growing and it's, it's a collaborate when it is that collaborative, um, effort is, I mean, that is part, that is why I love the job because it's so rewarding. So it's definitely not, you know, sometimes I feel like, um, uh, I ha I've never ha experienced that with, with any of my clients, but when I look at, at Instagram and these kind of funny things that are going around, but also this kind of fear that the editor is somehow there to um, almost want to put their name on your work. Mm. And that is not what this job is. This is about <laughs> getting like, you know, I, and I speak for all three of us, I'm sure, but we want you to excel. <laughs> we want your book to- Absolutely. To to um, take off and, and be a success. That's the, that's the whole point. And it's not in any way an ego trip. It's about, no. it's about helping and assisting and propping up and supporting in any way that we can. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, really a successful editor is an editor who's invisible. <laughs> yeah. if, a, if a book is poorly edited and people can tell 
and they're like, oh, this needed a better editor. Well, then yes, that's a problem. But if someone reads a book that's really well edited, they're not even going to think about the editor. And that means the editor did their job right. Are there any final tips we want to give about self-editing? I think a tip for if you want to save money on editing and also help your editor out would be to check over some common errors in your book before you send it off. Yeah. So things like uh, check over the spelling of proper nouns. So the, the names of your main characters, the names of places, things like that. Um, chapter headings is a big one. I often find, you know, there's two chapter 37s in this book. So if you can fix that, that'll save your editor some time. Absolutely. Yeah. Familiar with like spelling, like American versus Canadian versus British spelling, that helps. Yep. Just little things like that. Um, my main tip for self-editing, if you use Word, is to use the read aloud function. I use it all the time, especially when I'm ghostwriting for clients, um, because it, as much as it's a strange robot voice, it, it feels like someone else reading it to you. Um, and you'd be amazed like what you notice about um, the, sort of the flow of dialogue or like the uh, the pacing of a sentence that you wouldn't normally notice if you were just reading it um, in your own head or, you know, going through it with a pen or whatever. Um, it's a really, really useful tool to hear it out loud and realize that maybe your word choices and the pacing is just not going the way you think it was. So that's my main tip. <laughs> That's a good tip. It's a really good tip. You're, you're never going to be finished, if that makes <laughs> sense. And that's, embrace that, because that's the fun of it, I think, you know. And uh, yeah, just look at every single new um, thing that you go through, whether it be critique, critiques, receiving feedback, um, looking for and hiring an, hiring an editor, all of these stepping stones all of these things that you're going through is it's just helping you grow as a writer and yeah. yeah I think that's a really good point to end on actually um how do our listeners know that they are ready to finish with self-editing and get a professional editor in to finish their manuscripts this is a good question and a hard question <laughs> so difficult <laughs> I mean for me I'm I'm at this spot like if if you come to me with your with your novel um it's so depend it, it's very difficult I think for a writer to know which stage they're at with their writing but I think that if you feel ready if you feel ready to hire an editor and you feel ready for someone else to to get their eyes on your work then don't don't think that and now I'm going to publish in two months because that might not happen. <laughs> <laughs> Be realistic because if you come to me with a novel where I give you feedback and I say these things need strengthening and that means rewriting things and rewriting um, possibly a lot even if we still kind of keep the main structure you need to be ready for that. It's not a critique at, you know, it's not saying this sucks. It's just that to make this as good as it can possibly get, we need to work on this together. So, and then it's almost like the editor goes into becoming your writing coach and helping you really, like that's a developmental edit. You really work together to strengthen your novel. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's difficult for a writer to know which stage they're at, I think. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are not ready to take it to an editor. You just need to be ready that it doesn't, thinking I'm ready for an editor doesn't necessarily mean that the book is ready for publishing. <laughs> you know, after a bit of grammatical checking, that's possibly not what the editor is going to advise. So. Yeah, because there's a huge difference between an editor and a, and a proofreader. And really the proofreading should be like the last thing after everything else is done. Yeah, absolutely. And I think from a money perspective, you need to be aware of like what type of edit you need at, at what time, because you, <laughs> otherwise you might end up getting three different developmental edits because you didn't realize that it was going to need so many revisions. I think um, you've got to put in the hard slog by yourself 
of self-editing and, and using beta readers and other people who can give you feedback to like really develop your manuscript before you go to developmental editing because otherwise you might find that <laughs> you go for a lot of rounds of editing and if budget is a, is a constraint for you which it is for most self-published authors then um, yeah have a have a good think about what type of editing you want at, at what time but that's also like I would always suggest getting a a like professional editorial assessment done because then the editor will assess where in the in your progression you are and if the if if you know if I suggest to you oh actually this and this and this needs strengthening in your novel you might say oh actually then I'm going to take two or three months and work on that by myself like yeah. let's pause this yeah and um you know you can always come back and say and now I'm ready for an actual developmental edit and we'll go in and we'll look at it together but um there are stages to this as well and and kind of nothing is entirely set in stone so it's good to take advantage I think of those um yeah. possibilities as well yeah I was gonna say like probably don't send in your first draft because first draft <laughs> is always terrible yeah to make sure you get feedback and that you have done self-editing because if you just send off your first draft you're going to be spending a lot of money yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And I think being aware too, like you said, when you send it to an editor, I know a lot of people contact me and say, hey, all I need is a copy edit. And I'll go through it and say, well, yes, you need a copy edit, but there are also a bunch of things that you could do to make your story a lot stronger. So why don't we do some developmental work? So I think that, you know, being willing to accept that criticism and being willing to say, you know, I think my story is really good, but then it might not be. So expect that expect yeah. your editor to give you perhaps more criticism than you're than you thought you would need but also keep in mind that they're not doing it to destroy your work or to be mean like quite the opposite yeah yeah exactly, exactly. yeah it's um it's a tough love kind of <laughs> kindness sometimes that yeah we have to do and it is the worst feeling as an editor to especially if someone is restrained by um, budget rather than like it, it they don't realize that they need a developmental edit or you know um, and they send it to you and you say oh it just needs like a line edit or a copy you know or a proofread even and you go in and you're like oh I wish I could I wish I could give you developmental comments because you know there's so many things that you could sort of do better here um, yeah you've got to be prepared um, and it's not because we're mean it's quite the opposite we really want to see you shine like do it do the best that you can yeah I think that's a, a misconception that people have too is that editors are just going to go in and fix everything or change everything mm -hmm. but the reality is is we make suggestions and it's yep. still the author's decision whether or not to change things so it is ultimately the author's story yeah and and um in the first episode of this series we we talked about how self-publishing is about creative control mm -hmm. um and i think you need to be prepared to listen to the advice but also like it is your own project um and it's something that i actually put in my like client disclosure forms is like this is your own project and you need to be prepared to take responsibility for it because if you think like i can do whatever i want and then send it to an editor and they're just gonna you know pull it apart and and change everything for me then like you're completely wrong it is you're in the driver's seat and you need to be prepared for like the two sides of that the positive and the negative side of actually having the responsibility <laughs> to like handle your manuscript to make it the best it can be yeah i think we've said everything we want to say on the topic of self-editing Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much to our guests, um, Annalie and Brenna for coming on. Make sure that you check out their websites and social media, and especially if you're looking for a good editor. Um, please comment, like, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. It really helps give us a boost in the algorithm. You can also find us on Patreon for as little as a pound a month to support uh, us making this writing content and you can also get some really cool rewards like our merchandise bookmarks stickers and some other cool stuff thank you very much for listening and we look forward to you listening next week bye